my name is Chris. Uh, I'm the CEO of a company called Astroscale, and we are focused on space debris removal. Um, we, in the industry, recognize that it's a serious problem, but finding a solution for it has never been done. Uh, it's really tough to figure out the technology, it's really tough to figure out the business case, and it's really tough to figure out the policy background. It's, uh, when you're talking about outer space, that's a non-governable area, it's a commons. And so how do you really uh, legislate an area that doesn't have um, a government that oversees it? So these are some of the huge challenges that, that we have as a, as a company. So I'll go over what the issue is, why it's a problem, a bit about our company, a bit about those three challenges that I just mentioned, and then happy to take questions. And happy to take questions as I talk, as Norbert said. So just raise your hand and interrupt me as I'm going. Um, first, in terms of using space, uh, people don't really recognize it. Maybe everyone here does, but we use it every day. And we use it in, in so many ways that we just it's hard to even uh, comprehend how much it infiltrates our lives. Uh, me finding this place today, I was using Google Maps. Uh, and a lot of that data, a lot of that information is coming from satellites. Uh, when you wake up in the morning, you check your bank account, uh, you check the weather, um, you want to talk to your friends in Europe or the States or Canada or wherever, you're most of the time using space-connected data. We're completely reliant on satellites for our daily activities. And beyond that, we're reliant on it to understand climate, uh, the military is reliant on it for troop movements, and we're going to be even more reliant on it going forward in things like self-driving cars, uh, IoT, Internet of Things. All of that is going to be dependent on data from satellites. And so we have to make sure that every data that we're receiving there is, is protected. Uh, and right now, there are risks. And there are risks because all of these satellites have been shot up over the past 62 years since Sputnik in 1957. They've been shot up, and a lot of them haven't come back down. And a lot of small pieces of satellites have broken off. And there have been some collisions that have created more debris. And all of that is still up there, and it stays up there. So the issue is that everything that's orbiting Earth is basically falling. It's like, a, it's like a drain, like a sink, and the water's going down, and as it gets closer to the drain, it goes faster and faster and faster. But when it's up top, and it's going around, it's going around a bit slower. And so things are a bit higher above the Earth. They're falling, they're going down the drain, but they're going slowly. And some of the stuff, when it gets higher up there, it stays up for centuries. And so for hundreds of years, you've got these pieces of debris that are up in space that are a risk to the data that we're getting every day. And when you look at what's happened, this is a visualization, there's the first satellite, Sputnik 1, launched. So visualization of all the satellites that have been launched since 1957, and you can see now they're green, and you look at the key up to the top left, and the active satellites are in green, inactive are ones that have finished their mission life, and then debris is in red. And you can see as we're getting through the 80s, the number is starting to climb. This is objects orbiting the Earth. So this is all objects orbiting the Earth. And it's starting to climb now, more and more. And you can see the number of red, which is debris, growing increasingly. Especially in that area right around Earth, which is called low Earth orbit, or LEO. And right around low Earth orbit, which is between about 200 kilometers and about 2,000 kilometers elevation above us. That's all that area where the red is. And so you can't even see the Earth. It's just a big blob of debris, is what it looks like at least. And you see this area out here, and this is called the geo belt. And that's where a lot of satellites are, a lot of communication satellites, um, a lot of military satellites are out there. That's about 35,000 kilometers away. And those satellites are targeted to a specific spot on Earth. So they move around with the Earth's rotation. So they're, at relative to Earth, they're not really moving. They're staying in that same location all the time. These ones down here in the middle, they are spinning. 
28,000 kilometers a second. They're moving in an hour. They're going so fast. It's like eight kilometers a second. So fast, like a bullet. And so they're spinning around really quickly. And so once every 90 minutes, they're going around the Earth. And that's where we see the major areas of debris. And that's where there's going to be a lot of activity going forward as well. And so you see all this up there. It's, it, it doesn't do it, it's not completely accurate. So it's not this crowded. Like here, it looks like you can't even squeeze you know, a, a pencil in there between all the debris. It's not that bad because space is still big. But the fact is that accidents still happen. And one of the more well-known ones was through a company called Iridium. And they do satellite communications. And they had about 60 or so satellites in orbit. And one of their satellites, their active satellites, collided with a defunct Russian satellite about 10 years ago. So here's Iridium 33, active satellite. Cosmos 2251 was a Russian satellite. And they collided at about 700 kilometers up. And so now there's pieces of debris every 90 minutes are crossing paths around the Earth about 700 kilometers up. A piece of debris about 700 kilometers up is naturally falling. It is degrading, so it will eventually come back into the atmosphere and burn up. But at that elevation, it will take probably 400 years, depending on solar cycles. So depending on the cycles of the sun, sometimes there are solar storms. Could be a little bit quicker, but let's just say centuries. Okay, generations. Our children and their children. It'll still be up there. So there's a lot of satellites in those regions and a lot of debris in those regions. And so another visualization of how that looked, this is basically that first video I was showing, showing all of the objects that are tracked in orbit by different types. Um, since that first Sputnik launch back in 1957, there's been about 9,000 satellites launched, about 9,000. What's changing now is the entire uh, landscape of space investment is, is, is at, a, is at a, a cost of change. Uh, costs to launch satellites are getting much cheaper. Costs to build satellites are getting much cheaper. Our reliance, like I showed in my first slide, our reliance on satellite data is growing more and more. And so that means there's more satellites being launched. And so in the next 10 years, the estimates are the conservative estimates are probably 10 to 15,000 satellites will launch in the next 10 years. So at least as much that has launched in the last 60, that has led to this level of debris, will be launching in the next 10. So the problem that currently exists is only going to get worse. And so right now, estimates are varied, but we're basically assuming that there's about 30,000 objects that are about 10 centimeters, the size of a baseball diameter. Uh, that will destroy the space station. That will destroy a large satellite and create a bunch more debris. Even the centimeter size objects, one to ten centimeters, about a million, uh, that would also likely do significant damage. And then hundreds of millions that are under a centimeter. Uh, uncertain what they would do, but they could pierce solar panels, they could at least disable the satellite, if not completely destroy it. So we're talking about a situation where there are orbital highways, and there's just a bunch of broken down cars on those orbital highways. And they're not just broken down sitting on the side of the road, they're broken down and spinning and moving down the road with nobody controlling them. And that's the situation that we're currently in right now. Yeah, no. So the, the two spikes that are there in the debris, so one is the iridium, and what's so, the other spike? Does anybody know what the other spike is? So the first one actually is a Chinese anti-satellite test. So the Chinese blew up one of their own satellites in orbit, uh, basically testing the weapon in space. And they did it at an altitude that was high enough, just like the Iridium explosion, to keep that debris in space for a long time. There was another recent anti-satellite test that you may have seen about in the news um, by India. India did the same thing. They blew up one of their old satellites in orbit. But they did it at a really low orbit. They did it at about 300 kilometers, 350. And so most of that debris, 
very quickly naturally degraded into the atmosphere and is gone now. A few pieces, we think, shot up above the space station. So when you hit it, you obviously can't control exactly where it's going to go. And a few pieces were tracked to go above the space station. So a very small, like literally under 10, probably were created that will probably come down fairly quickly. The Chinese did it at about six, 700 kilometers. It's up there for centuries. Yeah. Uh, are there any international global agreements regarding regulations on the orbital places? There's some, so there's standards. Um, and there's basically a generally accepted practices about what companies should do with their satellites. When they finish, one of the things is when they finish, and you finish your operations, you should get your satellite out of orbit within 25 years. It's still a long time, still too long in my opinion. But within 25 years, you finish, you should bring your satellite into the atmosphere and burn it up. Is it, is it forcible uh, agreement or not? It's just a general <laughs> agreement. General agreement. Just like so many things with the UN or controlled by international treaties. I mean, it's great, there's peer pressure. <laughs> but what else, I mean, there's really, I mean, when you think about in an area that is, that is in that kind of realm, there's not much else you can do. And, we're, and what we're trying to do, so I'll talk about the different ways that we're trying to impact this, to look at other examples, like, like Antarctica, for example, or ocean, o open oceans, open seas. Um, we can see some parallels even in things like air traffic management. Uh, one of the buzzwords now in this industry is space traffic management. How do we all work together to tell everybody where everything is and we can identify where those things are? There's of course a lot of things that are different. In air traffic management, we have um, airplanes have to avoid birds, but they don't have to avoid other flying airplanes that are <laughs> potentially gonna hit them. Uh, boats have to avoid debris, or they have to avoid maybe some barges that are uncrewed, easier to avoid in the ocean, you're not going as fast, you know, there's a lot of other less risky situations. But we're looking at those kind of, those kind of options. And then also when, when people launch a satellite, when a company launches a satellite, they have to get a license from the government where they're launching it. And so each national government has their own other distinct rules and says, okay, if you launch, then you need to be able to bring your satellite down in 15 years. Again, a bit hard to enforce. The only thing is they'd say, well, maybe next time we won't give you a license if you fail to do that, but again, really tough to, to enforce that, even domestically. So one of the big challenges we have. Um, so the other one was the one we saw, the radio and Cosmos. Um, one of the other big concerns is that is, is something called space situational awareness, SSA. How do we understand what's up there? It's a bit hard to track everything that's up there. And the, the, the cone of uncertainty uh, is, is kind of large. So they might get a warning that says there is a 20% chance that another object will come within 10 kilometers of you. So if you hear that as a company, what do you do? Do you take a chance and say, okay, I think I'll be okay. Uh, but then, and then where do you draw that line? You say, okay, now there's a 60% chance that this object's gonna come within two kilometers of you. Now you say, okay, maybe I'll move down 10 kilometers and make sure I'm totally clear of this. But the data we have is not so accurate. And I've talked to people involved in this crash and they said, we got like three warnings, four warnings that day. So what were we supposed to do? Which one do we listen to? Which one do we adhere to? And so it's a really difficult thing. And there's actually some companies who are building better ground-based radars to more clearly understand the environment. Then people can more safely manage their assets. Um, a lot of words, but let me try to explain it. This is future satellite launches being planned. And there's two main areas in low Earth orbit where people are focused on launching satellites. One is commercial telecom, and one is commercial remote sensing, which is Earth observation. So on your left is communication satellites. Those are generally a bit higher. Again, a bit higher, it stays in orbit longer. They don't need to keep boosting it up, so they're gonna cost a little more. They'll be up there a little bit longer. 
The ones that are a bit lower are, are Earth observation. They want to be closer to the Earth. They want to get better resolution on what they're trying to show. Look in the parentheses. Those are the planned numbers of satellites that are being launched. Again, keeping in mind, 9,000 satellites since 1957 have been launched. Look at the numbers that are planned with some of these satellites. You start doing quick math and you look at OneWeb, which is talking about a couple thousand. Look at SpaceX, which has 3,000 at 1,200 kilometers, but then you see them again down here at 600 kilometers with 1,600, and again down here at about 300 with 7,500. Lots of satellites being launched coming up. All the ones on the left, their goal is higher, uh, low latency communication, so quicker speed of communication. Big for any of you who I assume are in the financial industry, you want to have, you know, millisecond is a difference in terms of making transactions. They want to make sure they appeal to that. Big for gaming or video industry online. You want very, uh, you know, quick speed in terms of your, uh, of your downloads. Um, there is a huge market for this. The other thing that there's a huge market for is places where there isn't connectivity right now. Uh, Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, parts of South Asia, um, South America, there's areas where there isn't connectivity. So uh, there is a lot of people out there who don't have access. The goal of a lot of these, one web in particular, is talking about giving access to those who aren't connected right now. And that can help in a variety of ways from, again, communications, uh, banking, health, weather. Lots of satellites being launched. You see down there, not to scale, but the huge space station, 400 kilometers. That's where the space station is at 400 kilometers. So a lot of the debris that would pass through here as it goes into the Earth in, turn, in its deorbit will pass by the space station. And the space station right now has to move several times a year to get out of the way of debris that's going to hit it. Uh, astronauts on the ISS have had to get into their escape vehicles in the past to prepare for getting out of there because it looked like there was an imminent collision that they wouldn't be able to avoid. It does happen. If all of this stuff happens, it's going to happen more. If all of these get launched, it's going to happen more. If there isn't a clear plan for deorbit for all these. Um, I talked about the 25 year rule. 25 year, the generally accepted practice that once a satellite finishes its, its operations, it should come down in 25 years. At about 600 kilometers, that's about the extent of the 25 year rule. So all the satellites in the green, even if they fail in orbit, or if they have no other backup deorbit plan, they'll degrade naturally within 25 years. All of those won't. And it goes up quickly. It doesn't, it doesn't go up in a sequential like 30, 35, 40. It goes 25 and then about 800, as I said, it's several hundred years. And you're getting up to 1,000 or 1,200 kilometers, you're looking more like, like a, a millennia, 1,000 years. Um, so it, the, when you go up, it quickly increases in terms of the, the amount of time that you're going to be spending in space. So the problem is real. The solution is not easy to identify. And so our CEO and founder started this company about seven years ago, uh, six and a half, a single person, uh, Japanese, based in Singapore, and he was going out there and, and hearing about this problem, but only hearing about it. And there were universities or some agencies who were having ideas or R&D, but nobody was really trying to address it. And so he's like, he said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm going to fix this problem. He was an IT entrepreneur. He wanted to take that startup mindset into space. Uh, and from him, from the one person, we have since now raised $140 million. Uh, we have about 100 people globally. Started the office in Singapore in 2013. That's where we still have back office uh, finance legal support. We opened the office here about four years ago, four and a half. We now have about 60 people here, and this is where we're building our first satellite, technology demonstration mission. This is where the majority of our team is. We opened an office in the UK two years ago. In the UK, we're building a ground segment, so every satellite mission needs a space segment and a ground segment. Space segment brings down the data, the ground segment tracks it, brings it in. We're building our ground segment in the UK in Harwell, out near Oxford uh, in the UK. Have about 20 to 25 people there. We saw that we could, we will not survive without accessing the US market. From an R&D perspective, from a personnel perspective, from a future mission perspective, we need to have a US 
capability. So this past summer, we opened up an office based in Denver, Colorado. We also have people in Washington, D.C. to track policy. So overall, that's what the, the company is. Um, and our mission is a secure long-term space flight safety and orbital sustainability for the benefit of future generations. So we're a for-profit company. We expect there is a market here, and we're leading it. We're helping to, to drive it. We're helping to develop it. Uh, but we're also kind of an environmental company. And I, I see the, the orbital environment that we've been talking about as another natural resource, a non-renewable natural resource, just like rivers or lakes or mountains or trees. It, it's, gonna, it's gonna go away if we don't take proper care of it. And so that's one of the things we're really trying to, to do. So what's, what's great is that people who come work for us, they see the purpose and the vision that we have, as well as the fact that there's a market, there's a real reason behind what we're doing, there's a benefit for the future. Um, the problem, there's three of them, I talked about it from the start, and none of these things are easy to solve, and they're all interconnected. We've got to develop the technology. It's hard to grab something in space that's traveling at 28,000 kilometers an hour. The business case, who's going to pay for this? Great, cool, you're doing it. Tell me who's going to get this money that's going to pay for this stuff. What are the policies? How do you get somebody to develop a rule that gives some kind, of, some kind of regulation that forces companies to do this. All of these are inter interconnected. Uh, the technology will help inform the business case, which will help inform the policy, which will help inform it. It's all connected. And so we've got to focus on all these. So I'll, I'll go quickly through these three problem sets that we have and then, and then open up the questions and hear the next speaker. Um, this is our first technology demonstration mission. It's going to launch next year. It's called ELSA-D, End of Life Services by Astroscale Demonstration. Um, what, we're, what we're proposing to do, this is for future satellites that will launch. All of those on that map with the circles and the parenthetical numbers, every one of those should have one of these docking plates on there. This docking plate has a ferrous material, so it can be attached to by a magnet. Make it easier for us to find you and grab you and get you out of commission. The same way that your car, you know, used to have a hitch on the back of your car so the tow truck, AAA in the US, JAF here in Japan, could come and grab onto the back and pull you out of the way, just make it easier to bring you out of the way. Right now, no satellites have this thing on there, so let's make it more simple. We would propose them launching a satellite, this is our Chaser satellite, it will have a magnet at the edge of it to come up and find that ferrous plate and attach to it. So I'll do a quick video here of our um, first mission concept of operations. If I can. Um, so we're launching this. It's going to be not too loud, is it? Uh, next year um, on a Russian Soyuz rocket uh, from Kazakhstan, and we're going to launch these two satellites together. They're going to be connected, and then they're going to separate. And there's that plate. It has optical markers on it, which makes it easier to find. Our chaser satellite has eight different thrusters, so it can more easily rendezvous, come close to, reach out, and then attach to that piece of fake debris. That's our piece of debris that we're proving that we can do this. The second time, we're gonna release that piece of debris and tumble it, because a lot of the debris in space is not stable, it's tumbling. We'll map the tumble, synchronize the tumble of the debris, with our chaser, using those eight different thrusters to spin it around. Onboard cameras, looking for that ferrous plate that's on the piece of debris. Once we find it, we'll come in, again, extend the arm with the magnet at the edge of it, attach to it, and then stabilize. Stabilize the third time, we'll throw the target farther away outside of the field of view of the cameras that are on board our chaser satellite. We'll do this walking safety ellipse because we know that our target debris is right there in front of us so we don't hit it inadvertently. We go there in a circle as we're coming up. We're using ground-based sensors as well as our onboard cameras as we get closer to locate it, grab it again. So we're trying to demonstrate to businesses the capability to find, rendezvous, and attach to a piece of debris. For this mission, 
will bring it down and deorbit it after just a technology demonstration. For future missions, we need to do multiple retrievals. One retrieval for one piece of trash, not going to cut it from a, um, from a business point of view. Uh, way too expensive to launch and build a satellite for every piece of debris that we're going to grab. So we need to do a couple different times, which is a lot harder than it sounds because you've seen gravity. If you've seen the movie Gravity, where the, there was a collision in space and there was this debris, and Sandra Bullock and George Clooney were like shooting through space like it was swimming across a pool, and they're just like, bing, bing, yeah. doesn't happen like that in space. It's really hard to change orbits, to change elevations. So we have to really work on building a capability that can go up, grab one of those satellites at 1,000 kilometers, bring it down below the space station, release it, and go back up again and get another one. It takes a lot of what's called delta V, or change in velocity, or power, to get up and down like that. So that's going to be tough. Now I know you're thinking, okay, that's great for all of those future satellites, but what about all the junk that's up there right now? It doesn't have that plate on there. So we're thinking about that too. Where a lot of the internal technology we have, the um, software, and the guidance capability, that can be the same. We can use a lot of the similar type of stuff. What's going to be a big difference is the capture. And so we're working on the possibility of a, a, a separate capture mechanism. Uh, and there's companies that are building robotic arms, some might be here tonight, that we're talking, <laughs> that we're talking to. And so there's possibilities of using a robotic arm to grab onto a satellite. One other possibility is this is, this is the simulation of an upper stage rocket body. When rockets launch, the first stage drops down and either burns up in the atmosphere or drops into the ocean, but upper stages stay up there, just like some of those satellites. And so they have these things called a payload adapter fairing, PAF, and so we'd like to go in there and extend arms out and clap on to this, and then use that as our way to bring it down. Now this is a lot bigger than any of the satellites will bring down, so we'll need a bigger, a bigger chaser. It'll have to have more fuel capacity to be able to bring this down all the way in. Uh, we'll also have to use this, it'll have to come down as a, uh, all the way into the atmosphere. We couldn't release it because a lot of this won't burn up in the atmosphere. So we'll have to bring it down in a controlled re-entry. So there's going to be a lot of differences, but there's governments that are interested in this. The Japanese government is very interested and they're setting the stage globally for, for doing these kind of missions. They recognize that they have a responsibility to clean it up and we're a company that's developing a technology domestically. They're excited about that. The Japanese government is really interested. The European government is really interested in seeing something happen. And the U.S. too is talking about it. No missions from the U.S., but a lot of discussion about regulation and trying to put R&D money toward it. So who's interested in this? A lot of people because the space sector is changing so much. For the first 40, 50 years of space, it was all dominated by governments and huge companies. What we've seen in the last 10 years or so is just this huge push from entrepreneurial space. An incredible amount of equity investment. Now, I know, again, in FinTech, $24 billion maybe is not too much. That's maybe not, not a lot in the financial world in Tokyo. But in the space world, $24 billion of equity investment is crazy. And people who are putting that money into space want to protect it. And so as we see more investment going in, and you can see from this chart that most of this is in satellites and launch vehicles, those two first colors. People are interested in protecting their satellites that they're launching. People want to bring down those launch vehicles that they're leaving up there. They don't want to contribute to long-term uh, non-sustainability of space. So there is a growing interest in this. And so as we see our business model, we look at two different revenue streams. And one are these satellite constellations, that's that one slide with all those circles and all those numbers on it, all those companies that are going to be launching satellites. How many will fail? Oh, you know, it's been much more than 10% historically. If we're assuming that it gets better, let's say 10% of those fail, 15,000 launched. Do the math, you're looking at four digits of, of numbers, you know, 1,500, 1,000 to 2,000 pieces of debris that are left up there in space. The other is the existing space debris. So that's the companies that have, the, the, the governments that have left upper stage rocket bodies or failed satellites in orbit. Start bringing down a couple of those a year, really reduce the risk, really support your citizens. 
That's what a government should be doing, is making sure that their citizens have long-term viability to a better life. That's what will do it. So we're talking to governments, we're talking to commercial companies, and when we talk to those commercial companies, why should you pay for the service? We see that there's significant reasons even outside of governments forcing you to. It's great if the government says there's a rule for you to go bring down your degree. We think that there's an incentive just from a business continuity perspective. You want to make sure your constellation, your satellites remain operational. They don't want to get hit by something else in that neighborhood, so why don't we all start bringing stuff down? So ensure your operational service. Reduce those risks, get them out of the way. Manage the regulatory risk. Governments are going to be putting some rules on this. It's gonna happen, so get ahead of it. Uh, model behavior. Uh, consumers these days are looking at companies that are responsible. And when companies are not responsible, whether it's environmentally or socially, they take their money elsewhere. So let's be prepared for that kind of consumer and make sure that you as a satellite operator are ready for that. Insurance, we're talking to insurance companies, that's a big potential. If you can prepare your satellite for deorbit, you can bring down some of your trash, maybe your insurance premiums get reduced. Uh, and then protect future orbital operations. The environmental argument, that doesn't always win the day. Obviously the economic argument is always bigger, but be environmentally responsible. Be on the right side of history. Don't be the chemical company that dumps a bunch of stuff into the rivers and then has to pay the fines for it. Take care of it now. And then, so the final problem that we're dealing with is the policy problem. And we are in the middle of talking to all of the players in this room. So international organizations, uh, UN, World Economic Forum, uh, International Standards Organization, the IADC is the Interagency Space Debris Coordination Committee, a bunch of space agencies, NASA and JAXA and ESA, get together and talk about how do we reduce space debris. We're talking to them. So we're talking to these international groups that set these generally accepted practices. We're talking to industry groups. There's a lot of companies that are launching this say, we don't want the government to come in here and regulate us, and they don't know what they're doing. We want to be able to tell them, here is what we think would be the best way to go. So there's industry groups, and we're on a variety of executive committees and boards that are helping to form those. Talking to those academia and NGOs to model out, okay, where are the risks? How high are they? What are the, what are the chances? A thousand more satellites launch, 10% fail. What are the new risks? To a, to a potential collision in space. A collision happens, now there's a thousand new pieces. How does that risk increase? So talking to academia to play out those numbers and to see where the risks increase. And finally, talking to governments. We have offices in Tokyo, in DC, outside of London, we're there. We're talking to governments all the time and saying, if you're gonna give licenses, make sure that the company you're giving license to is gonna act responsibly. So from a technology perspective, from a business case perspective, from a policy perspective, the challenges are huge. But it's what makes it such a fun job. Because all of these things interact, and we're trying to address all of these together. So I'll just leave you this picture. This is what it looked like in about September 1957 in terms of human-made objects in space. And as you've seen, here's what it looks like now. So we get a lot of benefit from all of those things that are in space. But there's a lot of risk as well. And so we just need to make sure that we mitigate that risk, not just for future generations, but for now, for our lifetime. How are we gonna make sure that we benefit, we continue to benefit from what we get from space satellites. So that's it for Astroscale. I'm happy to talk a lot more. If there's any questions, thanks.